everyone. Uh, hello, and my name is Finbar Roach, and I am the CEO of Fighting Blindness. You're all very welcome. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the, this webinar where we will hear from uh, Dr. Rachel Birmingham and Ben Shaberman of Foundation Fighting Blindness. Uh, it's an extremely exciting time for fighting blindness as we prepare for the Retina International World Congress next June. We will bring some of the world leading vision researchers and clinicians to Dublin, and we hope you will all be part of it. From our foundation, fighting blindness has been about finding answers and finding a cure. We have funded world leading research and our impact is being felt. We were the first to discover rhodopsin as a cause of RP, and today we have a treatment for a very limited number of people on the cusp of approval, if the government will listen to us. Rachel has been leading on public and patient involvement in research, and will take you through more of our work if this is something that interests you. Um, we would ask that you would join our VIP network. More information on that is on our website, fightingblindness.ie. Our fight against blindness is a global one and we're lucky to have partners through Retina International and other connections. Ben Chaberman from Federation Fighting Blindness in the US has been a friend to fighting blindness for many years. His contributions to our Retina conferences have always been extremely popular. Uh, he is a great friend to our organization and to us and our community appreciates his time and care in answering questions. He starred on a morning show for us recently at an ungodly hour uh, and was extremely impressive, even though the makeup was uh, questionable at the time. Uh, I want to thank both our speakers and I encourage you to ask questions and remember to join the VIP network and become a member of Fighting Blindness if you would like to get more involved. You have a valuable contribution to make to research and we want to hear your voice. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Finbar. Um, and yes, as Finbar said, welcome everybody. Um, so I, the format really is I'm going to speak next and then Ben is going to speak and then um, we're going to take questions. So I'll just share my screen. Now, so yeah, just some housekeeping bits to begin. Um, first of all, welcome. Um, as we said, thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. And um, the webinar is being recorded. So this is being done so that, uh, that it's available on the Fighting Blindness website for those who couldn't join. But it's, it means it's also available for everybody um, to look back if there's parts of the webinar that you want to look back on. Um, as I said, questions can be submitted through the questions and answer box. These questions are only sent to the hosts, so we only see them, and um, not everybody on the webinar. And they can also be submitted anonymously if you want. There's just a, um, a box that you tick. So like I said, uh, I'll be speaking first and then Ben, and then we will uh, address any questions that come in. So I am Rachel, and um, I'm the research manager here at Fighting Blindness. Um, and I'm gonna be talking on public and patient involvement and the VIP network. Um, so just a little bit about who are fighting blindness, because I'm aware that maybe people in the webinar and aren't particularly familiar with us or they know a bit about us, but not everything. So we are one of the leading Irish charities funding vision research in Ireland um, and abroad. Our priority is mainly around inherited retinal diseases um, and age related macular degeneration or AMD. And we are a membership organization. As a bit of our history, the charity was initially set up in 1983 by families affected by IRDs. Um, and initially it was around um, trying to pull together support for people affected by IRDs, but then it quickly uh, became more focused on research as well as support. So who are we? Uh, there's 15 members of staff currently. Um, on the research team, which I'm a part of, there are four members, uh, there's myself, so my colleague Ellen, uh, Shannon and Constantina, and they're both on the call today. Um, and we're based in Eli Place in Dublin too, which is just off Stevens Green, for those of you who know the area. So our vision and our mission really is to find treatments and cures. And this is done through promoting and facilitating the, the development of treatment and cures for those affected by sight loss. 
Um, as I mentioned, research and support are kind of features, key features of fighting blindness in particular research. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're committed to driving the development of therapies for those affected by our IRDs and AMD. So research really is a core feature of fighting blindness and we fund research and we are involved um, kind of in the research landscape in Ireland. Alongside that, we have support. So we actually provide professional counselling and other support services to people and families affected by sight loss. And finally, we have advocacy. Um, so we advocate for equal access for diagnosis and therapies for those living with sight loss. So these are our three pillars of research being the, the core pillar. But also something that is incredibly important to a charity is fundraising. So Fundraising underpins all of these activities and allows us to do what we do. Um, and the fundraising is through donations and things like corporate sponsorship. So uh, we do have a fundraising department, which is integral to um, how we function. So our funded researcher research in numbers. Um, since we were founded, we have funded over 115 projects, both in Ireland and internationally. And that means we've invested about 20 million euro in research since we were funded, which is quite significant for a charity um, our size. We also, many of you might have attended or have heard of our Retina conference, and we have ran this annually since 2009. Um, and bar the COVID years, it was always took place in person. And as part of the conference, we have a scientific day where we have international speakers in the vision loss area speak. Um, and we also have a public engagement day, again, where people can hear about the latest updates and research um, and also things around support. And some of you might uh, remember Ben from some of these uh, retina conferences. And just something of note that um, Finbar mentioned in uh, his opening is that we were one of the one of our funded researchers was uh, the first to find a gene associated with sight loss globally. This is in 1989 and it was rhodopsin um, and it was found to be associated with ORP. So that's something we're very proud of and it's something that we have built on that research in uh, the years following. So just to let people know that we do have a website and it, it is very up to date thanks to Constantina. And um, so these uh, is just a snapshot here of some of the projects and researchers that we fund and on our website you can find um, up to date information on these projects and the link is there but like I said um, you can find it through fightingblindness.ie. So on to I suppose public um, and patient involvement PPI as it is shortened to. What exactly is PPI? So essentially it's where patients and the public have a direct input into research. In a nutshell that's what PPI is. The most commonly defined um, definition that's used for PPI is research, which is carried out either with or by members of the public, including patients, rather than to, about or for them. So really the key words here is research carried out with or by members of the public, including patients. So really it is having um, a direct input into decisions around research. Um, here I have a kind of a, an interaction triangle. So it just outlines different ways that people can interact with research and researchers and clinicians. And the kind of terms that are used um, are participation, engagement and involvement. And there can be kind of, um, I suppose, confusion, even for people working in the area, confusion around the different types of um, what these things mean. So just to clarify, I suppose here, participation, means that patients take part in research and some people on the webinar might have taken part in research through um, completing surveys or they might have um, been part of a study or a trial so that's where you're not having any input into the research you're actually just participating in the study um, and then we have engagement and this is where researchers connect with the patients or public audiences to share or describe their research so this might be someone um, kind of explaining their research to the public um, and this is engagement which is you know very important but again it wouldn't be classed as involvement whereas involvement is where the researchers and patients work together in partnership and this really is involvement that we're talking about um, today. So examples of public and patient involvement would be to sit um, a patient might sit on an advisory panel for a research project. So this is where they have a direct input 
uh, um, as part of this advisory panel. So they might have things input into things like the research project design at the beginning. They might have um, kind of twice, they might meet twice or three times a year to have input on how the uh, project is progressing. If um, you know they have ideas of how to improve it or things like that. But also as part of the panel, they might also have input into how to best communicate the research results because the results can be very technical. Um, whereas people you know, who don't have that background are, can be great to try and help translate it into an understandable way that it can reach a wider audience. Um, another example is to have um, PPI participants as a review research grant applications. And this is something that Fighting Blindness is hoping to do this year on our own grant applications. So this is where um, the PPI review panel would review PPI aspects of the applications and would have an input into um, which applications are selected. I went, and it also helps researchers improve their the PPI in their research. So going through all that, I suppose, why is it important? Because, you know, sometimes it can seem important, but until it's kind of outlined as to why it, it, it is so important. So obviously people with lived experience have unique perspective of their conditions. And this is invaluable because researchers and clinicians working on a condition know the scientific and clinical side of it, but don't, may not necessarily have lived with the condition themselves. So it just means that by people having, who have lived experience as part of the research team, having an input, at the very beginning or throughout the project, it just makes the research more relevant and potentially more impactful because from the start, you're addressing the needs of people who actually have the lived experience. Um, it also has um, benefits in terms of sharing research and results as it helps uh, researchers to come to make their uh, results more understandable and the communication can go wider than just the scientific community. It can be uh, spread to the public and patients. So that is um, PPI. I'm gonna just show a video, which kind of sums up what I've talked about, but it is a nice video. And Shannon, our research officer, um, is featured in this video. Uh, it does have um, captions on it as well, uh, but it also has the audio, so. Learn more about the Fighting Blindness VIP Network with Dr. Shannon Lee, Research Officer, Fighting Blindness. My name is Dr. Shannon Lee and I'm the Research Officer here at Fighting Blindness. What is PPI? PPI stands for Public and Patient Involvement and this describes research carried out with or by people with the lived experience rather than to, about or for them. What is the importance of PPI? So it's vital that the views and opinions of people living with sight loss are included in all areas of vision research. So this ensures that research is more relevant, more meaningful, and has a real impact on people living with sight loss. So in the past, patients have been involved in research as participants, such as participants in a study, or they've been engaged in research by being kept up to date with the latest advancements. Both participation and engagement in research are important, but involvement is even more important. What is involvement? Involvement is people affected by sight loss having a true contribution to decisions made around research. There are many ways in which people affected by sight loss can get involved in research. So these can include setting the priorities for a research study or advising on patient involvement in research grant proposals um, and even offering guidance on how best to share research with the wider public. What is the aim of PPI? So the aim of PPI is to create equal partnerships with people affected by sight loss and researchers. And facilitating these partnerships is a key aim for Fighting Blindness. As an organisation, we at Fighting Blindness are committed to involving people affected by sight loss in our own organisational activities. As an example, we aim to have people affected by sight loss involved in making decisions on what research should be funded. We at Fighting Blindness truly believe in nothing about us without us. So if you have any questions or are interested in PPI, 
You can contact the research department at research at fightingblindness.ie or you can give us a call um, at 01678 9004. Great. Um, so yeah, that was a nice video. I think that probably concisely uh, put together what I had on my slides. And thank you, Shannon, for the video. Um, and that video is on our website as well, if people want to look back at it. So just moving on from the um, PPI, I'm moving into the, the Visually Impaired Persons Network or the VIP Network, just to explain that a little more. So this is a fighting blindness initiative. Um, and it is composed, the VIP network is composed of visually impaired persons who are interested in becoming more involved in PPI and research and also our advocacy activities. Um, members of this group receive updates and invitations to participate in activities uh, such as involvement opportunities for researchers are fighting blindness, things like surveys, focus groups, training events, um, consultations and campaigns. And some of this will come from researchers uh, fighting blindness, but sometimes it can come from um, companies, clinicians. So what we would do is set we we would see yeah what we think would be of interest to the network, and we send that on um, to people who might be interested in it. So this is just an example of one of our VIP um, events that we held recently. So this was earlier this month in June, and there's photos there just of everybody in the offices um, in fighting blindness. So this coffee morning brought together VIP members and Retina Network Ireland members to meet and have a chat um, and have a coffee and chat about research. So the Retina Network Ireland is a, another network that fighting blindness has, but it's made up of researchers and clinicians who are working in the area of vision loss. Um, so we brought these two networks together, um, like I said, to to just have a chat around research. So it was, it was quite informal, but it was very successful. And it's something, um, an example really of something that VIP members can get involved in. So this is just a quote from one of the attendees. And they said that the meeting was a great way to let people with sight loss know what, that there is so much go, uh, research going on. And um, so it was a very positive event and we hope to run similar events going forward. Um, and as I said, membership is open to anybody affected by sight loss, uh, including people directly affected and their families. Um, you can contact research at fightingblindness.ie to uh, register your interest or call on 01678904. Members of this group, like I said, receive updates and invitations to participate, but also other information that might be of interest. But just to note that there's no, obliga no obligation to get involved um, when part of the network um, and it is all anonymous. You know, nobody sees that you're part of this network and no other members see that you're part of the network. Um, and it really is just voluntary and yeah, no obligation. So I have another video here to share. Um, and this is from Declan, who's our advocacy officer here at Fighting Blindness. And again, it's just... Um, summarizing, I suppose, the VIP network and the, the benefit of being involved. Um, apologies, I think there's a kind of a gray bar maybe showing up for people on the top of the screen. I'm not sure how to remove it at the moment. Uh, we'll, I'll, we'll try to figure that out, but I'll play the video now. Join the Fighting Blindness VIP network with Declan Mina, Advocacy Officer at Fighting Blindness. Hello, I'm Declan Mina, Advocacy Officer of Fighting Blindness, and today we're talking about the VIP Network. Fighting Blindness, our history and the importance of PPI. From the start, Fighting Blindness was about people who wanted to know about their eye condition. They had a rare eye condition that they thought had a genetic link, and the research that they funded found the first link to a gene and a genetic eye condition. We've now spent 40 years funding 20 million in research, and this has been co-created, co-funded by people impacted with sight loss. So it's really important that all the research 
funded by Fighting Blindness is done with full participation of people impacted by the research. That makes it more relevant, that makes it more useful and more effective. So now we want you to help us write the next chapter. We want you to join the VIP network. What does joining the VIP network entail? Joining the network means that you will be invited to take part in research. This could be as simple as a survey. It could be a half day commitment. And joining doesn't commit you to anything. All it does is let you be informed of what opportunities are out there. So joining the VIP network is free. Send the email and we'll be in touch asking you for more detail, but it is completely free and confidential. How do you store my medical data? We want to make sure that you get the best information and the most relevant opportunities. So we do ask you for information about your eye condition. So this information is held securely between our research and advocacy department. It's held in an encrypted database and it will only be used to get you information and opportunities to take part in research. Can you give me an example of PPI? So one example of uh, PPI activity that I took part in was a PPI Ignite event where we actually got people who had different conditions and researchers to sit around at tables and talk through examples. So this was a really inclusive way where we could get researchers at all levels from really basic research right up to transitional and, you know, other types of research and talk about, well, how would we get patients involved? So it was a really educational event and I think both researchers and patients got a lot out of it. 40 years ago, we didn't know what caused these conditions. And in that 40 years, a lot has changed. And now we're on the cusp of having a treatment for an inherited retinal condition available in Ireland. This is a really exciting time and we're going to need a lot more people involved in the VIP network to help develop more treatments and better treatments. So please join the VIP network today. If you're interested in joining the Fighting Blindness VIP network or learning more, please email us at research at fightingblindness.ie or phone us on 01 678 9004. Great. Um, so yeah, I hope that video summed up er everything that I had spoke about and thank you, Declan. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a sec and see if sharing again removes the, um, the box at the top. I don't think it has, so I'll just continue. Um, but I suppose that's the VIP network and PPI. Um, and like in the, I mentioned in the videos and I mentioned previously, really just contact research at fightingblindness.ie for more information. But we would really hope that um, this kind of inspires people to sign up to the network because the more people, um, I suppose the stronger the network. Um, but I just wanted to briefly talk before I hand you over to Ben about the Retina International World Congress. So this, like I mentioned, we annually hold a retina conference, um, but actually what we are doing next year is holding the International World Congress. Uh, so this is, you know, a, a more international conference. Um, and this is taking place in the Dublin Royal Convention Centre in Dublin. Uh, so that's the, the Radisson in, I think it's Golden Lane. And it's taking place on the 5th to the 8th of June in 2024. And as part of this, there will be the scientific day, there also will be a public engagement day. Um, so just to put that in your um, diaries or as a reminder for June, I know it seems like a long way off, but we all know that time flies. So it's going to be really exciting and we're going to have really great international speakers at it. Um, so we're hoping to open registrations for this uh, towards the end of the year, around October, November time. Um, but yeah, so that's me. I've given there the contact details, but I know I've given them before. But if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box um, and we can get to them later. So I'll stop sharing. And I will hand over to um, yourself, Ben. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Are, are my slides up for you? They are, yeah. Okay, let me just get it into 
presentation mode here. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel, Finbar, Shannon, the whole Fighting Blindness Ireland team. It's always an honor and a privilege to uh, present to your community. Um, we're in this together. Fighting Blindness is a, a global effort and uh, you have a lot of great research going on in Ireland and the EU. And um, again, excited to be a part of this. I was very excited to be in Dublin for your vision, your retina conference back in November to meet so many people live. And I have fond memories of a choir that sang James Taylor and Carol King, my American friends. It was a beautiful moment and the choir was beautiful. And uh, I just really enjoyed being a part of, of that conference. But today there will not be any James Taylor or Carol King, no singing from me. Um, but I am very pleased to present an update on some research. So just to give you a context of where the research is, we often talk about the number of clinical trials that are underway, and there are um, several dozen clinical trials, but on this slide, this is a relatively new slide that I put together. I have 40 different companies that are developing therapies in the inherited retinal disease space. This is really exciting. This just shows the amount of investment that's being made in therapies for retinal degenerations. And if you go back 10 or 15 years ago, this slide might have had two or three companies, maybe a few more. I, I, I don't recall exactly. But what's exciting is that the research that Fighting Blindness Ireland is funding, that Foundation Fighting Blindness in the US is funding and other people are funding, are attracting investments in this space. So what we're doing as a, a global effort is getting research to the point where we can attract these outside investments because, because we need these global commercial partners to get more treatments across the finish line. So I hope um, everyone is excited about this list of companies as I am, and it continues to grow. I apologize due to time. I'm not going to read them all, but um, again, it's a very impressive list. So uh, Rachel and Finbar both mentioned that Ireland is hopefully on the cusp of approving its first therapy for inherited retinal diseases. This is a therapy that I have on this slide, Luxterna, that is approved in the US and it is a gene therapy. And when we talk about gene therapies or what I often refer to as gene replacement therapies, it involves the delivery of healthy copies of a gene to replace the mutated copies that are causing the retinal condition. And so Luxterna is for people who have mutations in a gene called RPE65. When that gene is mutated, it usually causes labor congenital amaurosis, a pretty severe retinal disease. It, it um, is apparent, it causes a lot of vision loss in kids. And Luxterna has been, uh, had been in development for nearly 20 years before it was approved in the US in 2017. And excitingly, both in the clinical trial and after it was approved, this treatment has restored significant vision to kids and young adults who were born virtually blind. Many were able to put away their navigational canes after getting treated. They were able to see the faces of their loved ones, of their parents. Some could even see stars in the sky. And so very exciting gene therapy. And what this really has done, not only is this therapy obviously exciting because of what it's done for patients, it's provided affirmation to the research community and companies that gene therapy is in fact an effective way 
to treat retinal diseases. So that's a, a big part of where the development is going in gene therapies. And you'll learn from a few slides that I have in a bit, that gene therapy isn't just about replacing the bad gene. There are ways, what we call gene agnostic approaches that use gene therapy that work independent of the mutated gene. But I did want to talk about a couple of other gene replacement therapies that are in clinical trials. And specifically, uh, I wanted to mention three gene therapies that are in clinical trials for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. Um, in most cases, XLRP is caused by uh, mutations in the gene RPGR. And a company called Mira GTX, they're, they're a partner of Janssen. They are in a phase three clinical trial for their XLRP gene therapy. They've reported uh, vision improvements for people receiving this um, earlier uh, in their earlier phase trial. And this is a global study. And I believe there are sites in the UK for this particular clinical trial. Another partner of ours called AGTC, and actually they recently reformed to become Beacon Therapeutics. They're in phase two. They're working toward a phase three. They've also reported vision improvements in their earlier phase. Um, they're moving forward. And then another company called 4D Molecular Therapeutics is in still in phase one, two. And what they do a little differently is they inject their gene therapy into the vitreous, into the middle of the eye. The first two uh, projects that I talked about, they inject subretinally. It, it's a little more invasive when you inject subretinally, but you're getting the treatment closer to the photoreceptors. Both approaches have pros and cons, but I think it's exciting that um, both approaches are moving forward. We'll see what works and, and what uh, the safest approach might be. So another company that's doing some really great work in gene replacement is called Etsina Therapeutics. This is a relatively new company. I, I'm thinking it's about two years old. And it was founded by um, the woman I have pictured on the left here, Shannon Boy and her husband, Sanford. They are researchers at the University of Florida. Shannon is a renowned, very innovative uh, gene therapy developer. And at Sina, their first clinical trial is for LCA type 1, which is caused by mutations in the gene GUCY2D. In their phase one, two clinical trial, they've reported that the nine patients that received the highest dose had vision improvements. They could navigate a mobility course better and they had improvements in their overall retinal sensitivity. So now it's Sina uh, and Shannon are talking to the FDA to design and launch the next phase, the phase two, three, and hopefully um, if that's successful, they'll be able to get the treatment across the finish line. Itsina also has therapies in development for X-linked retinoschisis. They actually have authorization to launch their trial in the U.S. Stay tuned. That should happen pretty soon. And Shannon is also developing a gene therapy for Usher syndrome type 1B. A challenge with this particular form of Usher syndrome is the gene is really big. So you have to deliver it in two viral containers. We call this a dual vector system. This is a special gene therapy delivery mechanism. And Shannon is um, uh, advancing that now through lab studies and hopefully before too long, we can get that into the clinic. So, up to this point in my talk, I've been talking about gene replacement, but there are other ways that you can use gene therapy to try to save vision. And what I have on this slide is a gene therapy that's being developed by a French company called Sparing Vision. And this particular gene therapy doesn't replace anything 
um, any mutated gene. What it does is it expresses a protein that helps keep cones healthy. So in people with RP, what usually happens is they lose rods first and then the cones degenerate. And the reason cones degenerate is because the rods express a very important protein for cone survival. So what this gene therapy does is it expresses that protein that's important for cone su survival. And again, this is uh, uh, gene agnostic. So sparing vision uh, is developing this for people with RP, Usher syndrome, and uh, potentially other conditions. They have authorization in the US to launch a clinical trial. They're in that process right now. That trial will be at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and they will also launch a trial site in Paris. So this is something that we've been funding for many years, and we continue to fund this work. So gene agnostic, something to keep cones alive so you can maintain central vision. Cones are really important for central vision, reading, recognizing faces, perceiving colors, and seeing in lighted conditions. Now, another gene agnostic form of gene therapy that I, I'd like to talk about is called optogenetics. And on the right side of this slide, I have a side view of the retina. The retina is only a half a millimeter thick, but this is that half a millimeter um, uh, width that's blown up considerably. And at the top of this particular slide, I have uh, an image that shows the rods and the cones. Those red, green, and blue cells, those long, darker cells, those are cones and rods. And I have a big X going through those rods and cones to signify some, somebody with an advanced retinal disease who has lost all their rods and cones. Once you lose all your rods and cones, by definition, you've lost all your vision. But excitingly, researchers observe that there are other cells in the retina that survive after rods and cones are lost, namely bipolar cells and ganglion cells. Now, bipolar cells and ganglion cells normally don't process light the way rods and cones do. But what optogenetics is, it's a gene therapy to bestow light sensitivity to these bipolar cells or ganglion cells, depending on the type of treatment. And excitingly, there are four companies in clinical trials that are doing this, Gensite, Bionicsite, Nanoscope, and Kiora. So it's a way of using bipolar cells and ganglion cells as a backup system for somebody who's lost all their photoreceptors. Now, um, the, in these trials, people who really had no vision are able to now see some movement, basic objects, um, shapes. For example, in the bionic sight trial, some people are able to see the different symbols on playing cards like spades, clubs, diamonds, hearts. Uh, some people can identify uh, different shapes of fruit and vegetables. In the nanoscope trial, people are better able to navigate a very simple Y mobility course. So optogenetics at this stage won't restore 2020 vision. And we're not sure exactly how much vision it will ultimately restore as these projects move forward. But for people who have lost all their vision or most of their vision, these initial results are very exciting because I'm sure as many of you out there um, understand, even restoring a little bit of vision can go a long way in helping somebody be independent and do activities of daily living. Excitingly, there are other companies that are moving toward clinical trials, Novartis, and then Sparing Vision is actually targeting cones 
that have lost their ability to sense light, but still surviving. We call these dormant cones. And that trial should uh, hopefully start sometime in 2024. So I could do a whole half hour on optogenetics, but I'm gonna keep moving here. So switching gears, I wanted to talk about a small molecule, a drug that's in a clinical trial in Australia. This drug is called N-acetylcysteine amide, or we call it NACA for short. And it's a very powerful antioxidant. What researchers have learned from doing studies of the retina in both labs and humans, in animals and humans, is that oxidative stress plays a big role in causing retinal degeneration and vision loss in people with retinal conditions. What NACA does is it mitigates or tempers the oxidative stress to try to slow disease and preserve vision. So NACUITY that, that has developed this molecule is in a clinical trial in Australia for people with Usher syndrome. We think this could work for people with RP and maybe other retinal conditions. And they will provide their first official readout in a few months. And if those uh, results are encouraging, they will move the trial, or I should say launch another um, site for this trial in the US. Now this work is based on a molecule, the, an original molecule called N-acetylcysteine. Nacuity modified it to be more potent for the retina, more bioavailable for the retina. But the original molecule, NAC, is also moving into a clinical trial in the US. The challenge with that molecule is you have, just have to take a lot more of it. But we're excited that there are two opportunities using versions of, of this um, drug to potentially save vision. And this is gene agnostic. It's designed to work regardless of the mutated gene causing the disease. And finally, I wanted to close things out by talking about a cell-based therapy that's in a clinical trial here in the US at the National Eye Institute for people with advanced dry age-related macular degeneration. We call that geographic atrophy. So what researchers are doing there is they're taking the skin or actually the blood of patients. They're tweaking those blood cells to revert back to a stem cell-like state then they're making these into retinal cells, making the, the stem cells into what we call RPE cells. Those are the cells that are affected initially in people with age-related macular degeneration. So very cool, from a blood sample from a patient, you can make retinal cells. And what the researchers are doing is they're putting these RPE cells derived from patients onto a scaffold so they, they're very nice and organized. And then they're putting that patch, if you will, into the patients that have this condition. This is still a very early stage clinical trial. They haven't treated that many patients yet, but the process of making the cells, we call this inducing pluripotent stem cells. This is the first time this approach is being used in the US. So we're very excited to see this technology moving forward. And if it works, it's something that we can apply potentially to other retinal diseases like Stargardt disease and, and other, again, retinal conditions. So as I said at the beginning, there are dozens and dozens of treatments underway. I just gave you a sampling and an update of some of the things that I'm excited about but there's so much more going on. And I appreciate you learning and getting this update. And we in the US greatly appreciate your efforts to be involved in the research and drive the research. So I will stop there. And I think we can begin answering, at least attempting to answer some of the questions that are coming. Brilliant. Great, thanks so much, Ben. Um, apologies, it's gotten very dark in the room that I'm in. Um, 
so yeah we have we've got a number of questions in um so we might if you don't i'll stop that so yeah um thank you very much it's great to get that update because i think sometimes it's hard to pull it all together in one place it's brilliant to have it in, sure. in one do you want um, me to just go through the list in the chat rachel or did you want to monitor that yeah, so some of them, um, maybe I can ask. I think some of them are maybe uh, Declan and Shannon might be able to answer. So we did get in a question about um, or PLCA and what type of sunglass lenses to use. So I don't know if. Um, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, Declan, please. The camera there. Um, so. Hello everyone, Declan Green Advocacy Officer, you saw my video. Uh, these type are the ones I use, um, but it's actually for, they're different color filter lenses you can get. So I'm not gonna tell you which one because it is really dependent on what level of sight you have. So if you're in Ireland, you should contact NCBI and they can actually let you try out all the different colors and work with you to find out which ones are best for you. Thanks, Declan. And just while I have you there as well, I would just got a question about uh, technology and software developments for laptops and phones and um, who would be best to kind of help out with that on laptops and phones? Um, that's a webinar in itself. I mm -hmm. think basically if you have low vision, the good news is you can use any laptop or any phone because there's built in software and you can also buy additional software. So if you have no usable vision you're probably best to use an iphone and a windows laptop with something like either the free option nvda the paid option would be jaws so in terms of fighting blindness we have a peer tech technology support group and they meet online on zoom on monday and saturday at 11 o'clock they're called the exchange club because it's about people exchanging their technology experience so you're all very welcome to join that. Um, email, research any queries, and I'll get them and work with them. And NCBI has their labs team who work on technology as well. It is a really exciting part of this. And the good news is that there's a lot of technology that's improving all the time, and people are doing really exciting things with technology. So it is definitely one to look at. And of course, don't forget the smart speakers because they're they're, they're, they're the most accessible thing out there. They have no screen, so you have to talk to it. Brilliant. Great. Thank you, Declan. Thanks. Um, so we also got a question in, um, and it might be covered, has there been any research on gene therapy for cone rod dystrophy, also for Stickler syndrome? Right. I can, I can answer, um, answer that at least the cone rod side of things. So um, I mentioned a company earlier in my presentation called Beacon Therapeutics. And one of the founders of that company or one of their scientific advisors is a gentleman from uh, England uh, named Robert McLaren, University of Oxford. And his lab has been developing a gene therapy for cone rod dystrophy caused by mutations in the gene CDHR1. And Beacon has announced that they are um, working to move that gene therapy into a clinical trial. Uh, there might be other gene agnostic therapies like NACA, that molecule that I talked about at the end that might also be relevant um, for cone rod dystrophy as well. And I know there are some other cone rod dystrophy gene therapies in development. I'm just honestly most familiar with what Beacon is working on. And mm -hmm. offhand, I'm not aware of Stickler syndrome research. I apologize. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thanks, Ben. And um, we've got another question in about SMPs, sing single nucleotide polymorphisms. And the junk portion of the DNA uh, affects ind individual patients' responses towards the new medicine administered to the eye, e.g. in LAC10. Um, 
so we did get this in before the webinar. So um, I suppose in terms of that, there are maybe other genes that may be modifying the expression uh, of CEP290. So those same genes might impact the effect of a therapy as well. And we're not so sure if the junk DNA is having an impact and the severity of the retinal disease and the remaining retinal structure may be most relevant to a therapy's effect. I don't know if you had anything to add there, Ben. I know you input it. Yeah, I'm, so I, and I'm not exactly clear on what the um, person means by junk DNA, but a, a little more on our genes. Our genes are comprised of um, coding regions called exons. And that's where most of the mutations occur in those exons. But sometimes the mutations occur in non-coding regions called introns, but those are between the exons and those can cause problems too. The challenge with intronic mutations is they can be harder to find, but there are treatments um, that have, are being developed to address intronic mutations. And a gene therapy, if it's replacing the whole gene, would address that as mm -hmm. well. Okay, great. Um, so getting through the other questions. Um, does neuroprotective gene therapy offer improvement for LHON sufferers? So good question. So LHON stands for labor hereditary optic neuropathy. And just so everybody knows, whether you're talking about labor, congenital amaurosis, or Elhan, labor is just the doctor that discovered the disease or labeled it. Um, just for the record, Elhan and LCA are very different conditions. And Elhan affects the optic nerve. It's actually a mitochondrial disease. Mitochondria are like the engines or energy centers of our cells. So the neuroprotective gene therapy I talked about is not for the optic nerve. But excitingly, there's a company called Gensight, G-E-N-S-I-G-H-T, who is developing a gene therapy for Elhan. Um, and they've had some um, encouraging reports in their clinical trials. And I know they're trying to get approval for it and it may even be available through compassionate use. So I would encourage uh, somebody to go to the Gensite website and contact the company and see if he or she might be eligible to mm -hmm. take advantage of that. It's for a specific mitochondrial gene and I forget what that is offhand. That's not my area of expertise, but that's the most relevant thing in development right now for mm -hmm. Elha. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, so in terms of, we did get a question around PPI and it was a person asking if they need to have any knowledge, scientific knowledge or knowledge about research to become involved. And I can answer that and say, no, you don't need to have any prior knowledge of research or anything science at all um, to get involved. So yeah, please do. If you're interested, please do. Um, we have another, I suppose it's just a comment from someone who's, it's their first webinar and just thanking us. They don't have necessarily a gene mutation condition, but rather one uh, caused by contracting a disease. Um, but they said that the research like today's webinar fills them with hope um, that's so there is still something that can be done for them. So thank you for that comment. Um, another question in is how far are we from delivering gene therapies systematically? Can we conquer the retina blood barrier easily soon? So that's an interesting question. Yeah. And what I'll say is, for the retinal diseases, at least for a gene therapy, we don't really want to, quote unquote, conquer the blood retina barrier. Um, 
it's much safer and probably more effective to deliver genetic therapies directly to the eye outside of the blood retina barrier because the eye is self-contained. Once something is delivered systemically, if we're talking about a gene therapy, then the whole body is exposed to it. And you're at much greater risk for some type of immunological or systemic reaction. So actually for retinal gene therapies, the blood retina barrier is advantageous. We don't wanna go beyond that. Now, where the blood retina barrier can be problematic is for, let's say a systemic therapy, like a molecule that someone's taking orally that you want to get to the retina. And you just need to make sure that molecule is small enough that it can get through the blood retina barrier. Otherwise it would need to be injected into the uh -huh. eye. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and then there's just two more questions. So is there any research trials ongoing relation to the OTX2 gene? Yeah, I, I am not familiar with yeah. OTX2. And I'm wondering if that came from the same person who asked about something else. Um, yeah, I'm not that familiar with that gene. I apologize. Yeah, it's not something I've come across, but it is if they want to get in touch with research at Fighting Blind Asali, it's something that we can follow up on and try get information out um on it because you know there could be a group working it's just not something that um has come up on our radar um and there was a question in about we got in about alstrom syndrome um and it was just around supports available um on this condition so um again that is something that we can get directly in contact with the person about because unfortunately it's there isn't anything in Ireland in terms of support groups but there are there are in the UK um but we can liaise with that person if they want more information um and we just have time for I suppose one more question and I guess it, it, uh, it's about um I suppose hope and I know today we've, we've gone through everything that's happening but as someone maybe who doesn't know about what is going on, sometimes it can seem, you know, with gene therapies, they can be very expensive. Sometimes they're not available in every country. Sometimes the trials fail. Is it a hopeful time now for people who are affected by vision loss, in your opinion, Ben? Uh, yes, it is a very hopeful time. So going back to the beginning of my presentation, I listed all those companies, those 40 companies that are developing therapies. Again, if you go back 10 or 15 years, that list was very small. And so there's a lot of great research that's in clinical trials and moving into clinical trials. Now, science, two challenges with science. Things do fail. That's just part of science. And clinical trials, they take a long time, regardless of what disease, whether we're talking about cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, that research does move slowly. But given what I said, if you just look at the progress over the past 10 or 15 years, the progress has been incredible. We still have a ways to go. We need to get more treatments across the finish line. But I'm hoping that if we can get a couple of these gene agnostic approaches across the finish line in the next five to 10 years, then we can still help a lot of people. Things like optogenetics, neuroprotection. And again, there's a lot of good progress in gene replacement. So very much, we're very hopeful. Um, the, the science is incredible. And we just appreciate all that people can do by getting involved in the research or helping to, to fund the research. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we're just at six now. So um, unfortunately, don't have any time for there, any more questions. But 
feel free to contact us at Finding Blindness with any questions and um, we can follow up with Ben if they're particularly for anything that Ben spoke about or um, if there's any way that we can help. There's no, uh, it's best probably to email, but we've given the phone number as well. If you want to ring, that's no problem. So we might end it there. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, it's great to have such an attendance at the webinar. Like I said, the recording will be available um, online in the coming weeks. We just need to process it and get it up. Um, and as part of that, I mean, I can share my slides. I think we had a question about sharing your slides, Ben, but we can chat to you about that um, and see if we can do that. Because uh, I think for some people, they Certainly. appear to... I, When we're done here, I will send you the deck. Brilliant. Sure. Yeah, so we can share that with, with the attendees and people. Um, so yeah, on that note, thank you, Ben. Um, and it's been so informative and I really do think it is a time of hope and there's so much going on. And we're really at the, I feel, an exciting time. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Fighting Blindness Ireland and people of Ireland. It's always an honor to to be with you. So thank you for having me. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Bye.